Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And we've got a lot to talk about today, so let's just get right into it. On your screen is the logo for Microsoft because yesterday was Microsoft Announcement Day. And on my timeline and my various places on social media, a number of folks had some, let's call them interesting takes on some of these announcements. And I want to talk to you about them a little bit because while they've been reported as fairly large and significant for Microsoft, I don't really think that that is in fact the case. So let's talk about why. The first item here, the first news article is about GameStop. And this is highlighted as follows. GameStop announces multi-year strategic partnership with Microsoft. And this wound up hitting my timeline and people that asked me questions on this as GameStop has just been taken over by Microsoft. They're only going to sell Xboxes, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, that's interesting. I, I think I should read the press release. I should see what's going on here. A and that really isn't the case. So the announcement is as follows. GameStop Corp today announced that it has entered into a multi-year strategic partnership agreement with Microsoft Corp, further advancing its strategy to expand its physical and digital video game offerings as well as enhance the company's retail technology infrastructure. Through this partnership, GameStop will standardize the company's business operations on Microsoft's cloud solutions and hardware products to do various things, to make their store better. The partnership includes enterprise and commercial elements. So just from that description, I'm looking at this as a corporate lawyer. I look at that and say, well, that sounds like an enterprise deal. That sounds like Microsoft entering into a deal with the NFL where they only use Surface tablets, that kind of thing. And so when we press on, we see that it really is that kind of deal. Under this agreement, GameStop will standardize its back-end and in-store solution on Dynamics 365, Microsoft's portfolio of cloud-based business applications and customer data platform. This will enable store associates the ability to access Omnichannel insights, which omnichannel here meaning I think digital and physical, about customer preferences and purchasing history, real time information on product availability, subscriptions, pricing, and promotions, in order to provide a differentiated and personalized in store customer experience. Microsoft can offer us these cloud solutions. We can get some analytics. We can keep track of you a little bit better. Like if you were online and you were on the internet, we can get you cookies that we can use to give you, hopefully, better service at GameStop. Additionally, associates will be equipped with new Microsoft Surface devices that will transform the in-store experience and help unlock new retail experiences in the future. So right now, the big items are that GameStop is going to move its back-end infrastructure, the computers, the point of sales, everything else, over to Microsoft's cloud-based business applications, and all their associates are going to get Surface tablets. As part of the transformation, GameStop plans to roll out Microsoft 365 and Microsoft Teams to its stores empowering more than 30,000 store associates with enhanced productivity and collaboration tools. We're also going to use Teams. We're also going to use Outlook and Word and everything else that we recognize from Microsoft 365. The back end, the technology aspect of GameStop is now going to operate on Microsoft systems. Following decades as an essential provider of the Microsoft Xbox gaming platform and services, GameStop has expanded its Xbox family of product offerings to include Xbox All Access, which, if you're not familiar with it, is the way that you buy an Xbox like a cell phone and you pay for it over the course of, I think it's two years, while also subscribing to things like uh, Game Pass uh, and Xbox Gold. So when we talk about these kinds of things, it's important to note that there's very little that is consumer-facing. The only change that is consumer-facing in these paragraphs, which really describe the whole deal as explained to us today, is that GameStop will now be selling Xbox All Access, which a number of people brought up to me was actually something that had been suggested GameStop would be doing in the near future anyway. Now, there is this one line that I've highlighted in red that people have brought up in a number of places to indicate something that I don't think it really indicates. So it's in the paragraph about Xbox All Access, and they say, GameStop and Microsoft will both benefit from the customer acquisition and lifetime revenue value of each gamer brought into the Xbox ecosystem. And some people have read that sentence to mean that there is a revenue share component here, that GameStop is getting a commission if they sell an Xbox or if they sell a Game Pass or whatever else they might be doing through their store. 
That would usually have to be highlighted in a press release like this a little bit more fulsomely. Instead, this goes with the other paragraphs to explain why the first sentence of the paragraph is important, right? So if we go up and we look at Teams, we see with Teams, store associates will be more easily able to ask questions and share insights with one another, et cetera, et cetera. This says we're selling all access now and GameStop and Microsoft will both benefit from customer acquisition and lifetime revenue value. That, in my opinion, reads as, well, yes, GameStop's going to be able to sell Xbox All Access. Microsoft thinks that's going to be a popular product. GameStop will benefit from being on that All Access program, helping them sell that because Microsoft benefits from when an Xbox is sold and GameStop benefits from when people want to come in and buy an Xbox. And so when they own an Xbox and they want to buy video games and GameStop is hopefully even better situated than they currently are, which wouldn't be difficult, then When a customer becomes an Xbox player, GameStop benefits and Microsoft benefits. In other words, more gamers is better for both GameStop and Microsoft is really all that says, in my opinion. But some have been reading it to mean revenue share. If that is, in fact, the case, that's the kind of thing that would need to be disclosed uh, much more fulsomely, and I would expect it to be. So I really don't read it that way, which means ultimately, at the end of the day, this is an enterprise deal, right? The president of U.S. Enterprise Commercial from Microsoft gives the first quote. He says, GameStop has become a popular destination for gamers to find their favorite video games, hardware, and accessories, socialize with others in the community, try out new games, and get educated on the latest tips and trends. We want to support the existence of a physical place where gamers can go to some extent and, yes, see Xboxes, but just that we like that there are stores out there and GameStop, frankly, with their current financial situation and the state of physical media in general, and, of course, everything in 2020, uh, needs some help. Needs some help to get one of these things done. Phil Spencer talks about this because GameStop sells games. For many years, GameStop has been a strong go-to market partner for our gaming products, and we are excited about continuing and evolving that relationship for the launch of the Xbox Series X slash S. But at the end of the day, this is an enterprise deal. This is GameStop almost on the brink of bankruptcy, really struggling to find its place in the modern world with so many of these systems going digital, so many people buying their games digital, getting a bit of a backstop here from Microsoft giving them these Surface tablets, from giving them all of this access to their cloud-based solutions, all of these things that Microsoft undoubtedly thinks will help them sell Xboxes. They don't give the terms of this deal. It's unclear what money changed hands in what direction, and it's also unclear what marketing contribution GameStop has to make, whether they have to put up posters and things that say, you know, this is a Microsoft-run technology, whatever it might be that you see, like on the NFL sidelines, where all of the hoods and things say Microsoft and Surface and how wonderful Windows is. It's possible GameStop has that marketing obligation, and maybe that will affect buyers coming into the store about whether or not they get an Xbox versus a PlayStation. But this doesn't mean that GameStop is suddenly becoming an Xbox store, right? Microsoft closed its Xbox stores. This is an announcement from June 26. Microsoft Corp today announced a strategic change in its retail operations, including closing Microsoft store physical locations. Microsoft will continue to invest in its digital storefronts on Microsoft.com and stores in Xbox and Windows, reaching more than 1.2 billion people every month in 190 markets. This was done over the summer, And this is the kind of thing that you then plan out with GameStop. Microsoft has these facilities. They have Surface tablets that they were using in their Microsoft store. They have this acknowledgement that there is probably a usefulness to physical locations. And so they entered into a partnership. And what each side is getting from this, a little bit unclear. GameStop looks like it's getting a bunch of technology that it probably needs given its financial situation. Microsoft is probably getting a little bit more prominence and certainly prominence in the mind share of the GameStop executives, which will hopefully for Microsoft filter down to those associates. But does it mean that they're not going to sell Switches or Switch games or Playstations or PlayStation games? No, it doesn't mean that. And if it did, it would be the kind of thing that could become problematic for things like antitrust regulators, which of course we've been talking about extensively this past month. No, this is a lot more similar to what we saw last year and this year from Sony, right? I've pulled up a headline now. From Video Games Chronicle, Sony says its relationship with Microsoft is deepening following cloud tech deal. Microsoft and Sony announced a strategic partnership in May 2019, one that we discussed on this very channel. If you're interested, go find the video, which will result in the PlayStation Maker using Microsoft Azure data centers for cloud gaming and content streaming services. And they say that relationship is deepening 
as of the spring of this year. But Sony didn't suddenly become a Microsoft entity. The PlayStation 5 is still coming. Sony is still going to offer it. But Microsoft is not just a gaming company. They offer cloud services. They offer analytics. They offer server services. And so these companies like GameStop and like Sony can go and see if something that Microsoft is offering is the best value for what they hope to achieve without giving up all of their competitive or retail ends, depending on whether you're Sony or your GameStop. So when people look at articles like this, I would just say the following. This is a big deal. GameStop needed the help. Microsoft is giving them the help. This is clearly an answer to Microsoft cutting down its own physical presence. If you love physical presence in video games, it's nice to see GameStop get some support from someone. And Microsoft is a major player in gaming, as they have continued to show by buying Bethesda, by buying all these companies. If you like gaming, I think you should be in general in favor of these massive investments that Microsoft is making in gaming, if for only because that means they represent a legitimate competitor to Sony's market dominance. But that wasn't the only piece of information that came out on Microsoft yesterday. No, a little bit more Epic versus Apple touching is that Microsoft has once again poked their finger into this entire app fairness discussion by making some statements. 10 app store principles to promote choice, fairness, and innovation. 10 principles for the Microsoft Store on Windows. Now, before we get to it, if you think, hey, maybe that's on Xbox as well. Nope, you're wrong. And they try to address that. But it's one of the reasons why I think the story is here. And what Microsoft is trying to do is maybe not disingenuous, but is certainly trying to slice that onion very thinly to get credit from the Tim Sweeney's of the world to get on the right side of those regulators and that antitrust report that we just read while actually functionally doing very little to change their business operations and maybe benefit from them because if they can break up Apple or if they can require Apple to allow app stores or xCloud or whatever it might be, that they could benefit from that and they don't think it's going to swing around and hit their Xbox, but I can guarantee that a win for Epic would result in lawsuits against Microsoft and Sony with respect to their console walled gardens. Would they win those lawsuits? Would they lose them? Largely, that would depend on how Epic won their case and what exactly a judge or judges in respect of appeals decided on that case. But right now, Microsoft has clearly strategically decided that it wants to align itself with Epic and the Coalition for App Fairness. For software developers, app stores have become a critical gateway to some of the world's most popular digital platforms. We and others have raised questions and, at times, expressed concerns about app stores on other digital platforms, which will go unnamed. We're not going to say the word Apple. We'll leave that to CAF. However, we recognize that we should practice what we preach. So today, we are adopting 10 principles, building on the ideas and work of the Coalition for App Fairness to promote choice, ensure fairness, and promote innovation where on Windows 10, our most popular platform, and our own Microsoft Store on Windows 10. Now, what's notable here, right, is that this goes along with some of the arguments that Epic is making, that the computer is an open ecosystem and that the phone is not, and the phone should have to be. When one of the things that we've pointed out in this series is that phones are different from computers, and people keep saying, oh no, they're exactly the same. Obviously, they're not. As has been pointed out, phones fit in your pocket. Epic thinks that's important uh, for its argument. I have my doubts there, and so does the judge based on the oral arguments as presented. But they're clearly different products. And because they're clearly different products, a lot of what is said here is designed as a showpiece. It's smoke and mirrors. It's, oh, we're for app fairness because Microsoft wants to get in on Apple, wants to get most specifically xCloud operating on the iOS because it does have all those users. And Microsoft thinks that Game Pass and xCloud are the really important things for it, right? So that's one of the things that's happening strategically here is that Microsoft says, okay, maybe there is some limited risk that if we back Epic here, it turns around and smacks the App Store concept on the Xbox in general. But mostly from a five-year, 10-year time horizon, we aren't so concerned about having a walled garden on Xbox because we think our killer product is Game Pass. Our killer product is really outside of all of these discussions. So if we wind up losing there, then maybe it doesn't kill us in the same way that it might kill Sony. And hey, if it kills Sony, well, what do we care if we're Microsoft, right? So instead they adopt these rules. And if you aren't familiar with the Coalition for App Fairness, 
This is the Epic-led group of various kind of app developers that have fought against Apple and, and talked about all the reasons why Apple is bad. And they put out these specific app store principles. There is an entire video that we did in the series Epic versus Everyone that talks about the Coalition for App Fairness, what they are trying to do, the law changes that they are seeking. One of the things they say is that no developer should be required to use an app store exclusively or to use ancillary services of the app store owner, including payment systems, or to accept other supplementary obligations. No developer should be blocked from the platform based on business model. Every developer should have timely access to interoperability interfaces, all this stuff right? And Microsoft says, all right, we're going to back Epic because we'd really like to crack Apple and get access to that iOS just like they would. So they say developers will have the freedom to choose whether to distribute their apps for Windows through our app store. We will not block competing app stores on Windows. I'm sure Steam and Valve just breathed a sigh of relief there as if Microsoft or Windows would cut off where everybody actually buys things through their operating system because they would lose that. They would lose market share. They would get devastated by trying to do that, which is the operating question here, right? Apple has sold a product that people like, and you can disagree with the fact that they should like it, but they do. They've sold a bunch in barely over a decade, and whether or not that should be broken up is the question at the heart of the regulator's report, at the heart of Epic versus Apple, whether they should be forced to do what you want them to do to lower their rates, to allow this separate access. And from a philosophical standpoint, from an economic standpoint, there is no question that developers would love to have that happen, that developers would love to pay 15% instead of 30%, that they would love to potentially have a different app store on which to operate. But Apple did create this hardware, and it really doesn't separate itself from the Xbox, as we will see when we get to that paragraph of this statement from Microsoft, which to their credit, they actually make about why this isn't applying to Xbox. Their second principle, we will not block an app from Windows based on a developer's business model or how it delivers content and services, including whether content is installed on a device or streamed from the cloud. We will not block an app from Windows based on a developer's choice of which payment system to use for processing purchases made in its app. You got to like that language, right? This is the continued fight, the one that the antitrust regulators bought in respect of the congressional report, the one that I think is still very problematic in actually making. It's one that CAF makes. It's one that Microsoft makes here. That 30%, it isn't for access to the store. It isn't for access to the phones. It's just payment processing. We should be paying the same as PayPal or Stripe. We will give developers timely access to information about interoperability. We saw that. Every developer will have access to our app store as long as it meets objective standards and requirements, which Apple would at least argue is what they apply, although I think reasonable minds can certainly say that Apple fails in that regard fairly extensively and often. But those objective standards, they apply to security, privacy, and quality, sure, but also content right? Microsoft gets to decide what content is on its stores. This is a bit of a wishy-washy water sandwich of a promise, right? Our app store will charge reasonable fees that reflect the competition we face from other app stores on Windows and will not force a developer to sell within its app anything it doesn't want to sell. Now, that's interesting in and of itself, right? Steam charges 30%, Epic charges 12%, various other places charge 30%. I think Humble Bundle charges various percentages and you can give it to Humble Bundle or other places. So what does that mean, right? A reasonable fee is clearly incorporated into 30%. And if you want to potentially make more business, you lower that rate. Or if you're Epic, you lower that rate and then you sign exclusives up to make sure that business follows you over. But what's a reasonable fee? This isn't a promise at all. It's somewhere between 30 and zero. Maybe it's 50 if you give something special in your store. Who knows? Our app store will not prevent developers from communicating directly with their users through their apps for legitimate business purposes. Now, we all know what this is about because Apple says you can't tell people to go and buy something at a discount somewhere else other than the App Store. And they've gotten in trouble for that. I think it's a fairly justified rule from Apple. But here, Microsoft says they won't prevent communication for legitimate business purposes, seemingly allowing them to advertise elsewhere uh, through the Microsoft Windows Store app. It'll be interesting to see whether or not that, in fact, coalesces. But they're trying to adopt all of these things to say that this is what fairness looks like. Now, of course, the Coalition for App Fairness is not really aimed at computers. They don't have a problem with computers. In fact, they use computers as open systems, as examples throughout their documents to show that they aren't happy with what apps are right now, right? 
So this is actually nothing. This is a big nothing burger because Microsoft already does this because Apple and Macintosh already does this, right? That's one of the things that they keep bringing up against Apple that even the subcommittee of the judiciary brought up against Apple is, hey, the Mac allows an open system. And Apple says, well, okay, yes, but desktop computers and laptops are different from cell phones and we should be allowed to treat our products differently. And then... They say, okay, well, we don't agree with that. Phones are too important. And that's ultimately what Microsoft winds up saying as well. Now, it's important to note that as all this is going on, what is Microsoft trying to do? They're trying to break into iOS, in particular with the xCloud, which is one of their killer apps that they think helps sell Game Pass. It allows you to stream Game Pass games on various devices. They haven't been able to get onto iOS because Apple, and I think Microsoft is right on this, is asking Microsoft to have every single game that's on Game Pass as it rotates in and out approved separately by the Apple folks, even though from Apple's perspective, from the iPhone's perspective, it's effectively streaming a video. Yes, it's an interactive video, but it's not doing anything specifically that Apple should be concerned with. It's not operating on their systems. It's operating elsewhere, and all that the phone is getting is a streamed video. So like Netflix... Apple doesn't approve all of Netflix's entries, and I think they shouldn't probably have the ability to approve all of Microsoft's entries. And I think Apple is pushing a little bit too far here. But what they have done is they have said, well, maybe you can go with a browser, right? So if we look at this Business Insider article, we see that Microsoft told employees as of 12 hours ago, it plans to release a browser-based app for the Xbox Game Pass streaming service next year that will get around Apple App Store rules. It doesn't really get around them, as we will see. We absolutely will end up on iOS. Microsoft's gaming boss, Phil Spencer, told employees at that all-hands meeting that they are working on a direct browser-based solution. Now, Apple actually provides for that, right? If you go and you look at the developer guidelines, if the App Store model and guidelines are not best for your app or business idea, that's okay. We provide Safari for a great web experience, too. And streaming games are permitted so long as they adhere to all guidelines. And if you can't meet these guidelines, of course, there is always the open internet and web browser apps to reach all users outside of the app store. That they aren't trying to treat the open internet as anything other than open, but they are putting rules around the app store. And Amazon, through its new Luna streaming service, has decided to make a browser-facing app. Apparently, Microsoft is going to do the same thing. And Apple, in my opinion, both politically and from a kind of social perspective, would probably not be well advised to change this rule, even if Microsoft and Amazon prove successful in having those browser apps and getting to a far-reaching audience on the iPhone. This is not the kind of environment that Apple should be looking to change these rules, even though some people have been saying on The Verge and elsewhere that Apple will change this as soon as it's successful. I I have my doubts there, specifically with the spotlight that is currently on Apple. So Microsoft is trying to break in. Why do they care if they can do this browser solution? Well, if you remember from both the regulators report and other conversations that we've had with respect to Epic versus Google, for instance, and Epic versus Apple, that the browser-based solution is deemed to be inferior to the native app going through the app store operating on iOS. And I think that's probably right, unless you've got some real wizardry behind the scenes, a browser app is always gonna feel a little bit more clunky, is maybe not gonna perform as well on your phone or other device. And so it's not the maximally advantageous position for Microsoft or Amazon to be in. And so they would like to be natively supported, which is why you see things like Microsoft adopting the Coalition for App Fairness's positions. Now, they also say Windows 10 is an open platform. Really always has been. Computers are different than phones. Unlike some other popular digital platforms, not the Macintosh, but the iPhone, developers are free to choose how they distribute their apps. But there are other popular and competitive alternatives on Windows 10. Third-party app stores, such as those from Steam and Epic, are available for Windows and offer developers different pricing or revenue share options, standards, requirements, and features. Now, now one thing that's worth noting here, right? You keep hearing the word app. And this has come up in a number of places, the app market, the marketplace for apps. And one of the things that Epic has to try to establish in their lawsuit, and what the regulators have tried to establish as well, is that the applications that are operating on the iOS ecosystem are separate from every other ecosystem. One of the things that I think Microsoft really does stupidly here by adopting this statement, by quote unquote backing up Epic and the Coalition for App Fairness, is they blur the lines of what an app is, right? 
and I don't think Epic is paying attention to this. I don't think the Coalition for App Fairness is paying attention to this. But all of their arguments depend on the notion that getting onto iOS with particularity is important. But if the open computer ecosystem is also quote unquote apps, then Fortnite is already available on as an app on so many different mechanisms, on so many different platforms. This has, of course, been an Apple argument, but not with the language of apps. We've basically skipped and said, hey, the app marketplace is really talking about the mobile app marketplace. But if open computer apps are apps, then everything on the PC, everything on the Macintosh, everything everywhere is an app. And so iOS represents an even smaller percentage of the possibility of getting apps in the world. Right. And so I do think that this tends to blur the lines. I think this is interesting that Microsoft is doing this. I think you are seeing in real time a bunch of these companies that could be advantaged by having a court enforce a lower rate or other behavioral characteristics on Apple go for the kill that they see that the time is now to go try to get a lower rate, to try to go get hundreds of millions of dollars if they could succeed on these arguments. Whether or not they will succeed, of course, open question. That's why this series has gone as long as it has. But when we talk about these things, it's important to note that Microsoft here, even though this was reported in many, many, many places, didn't do anything really new. The Windows Store has whatever percentage of application sales on the PC that it does. Certainly not a significant amount of PC games, maybe a little bit more significant on the enterprise side of things. And so it's always easy for the underdog, the smaller company, to declare these kinds of things, right? It's why we see the Xbox Series X and Microsoft and Phil Spencer declare all of this stuff about backwards compatibility and open systems and support for the customer. It's because they lost the last generation. They're trying to win over support, which is great. We should be in favor of people trying to make these moves because competition helps the consumer at the end state. But should they win all of this? That's an open question as well. And finally, we get to the real tricky part, right? As we've noted, this doesn't apply to the Xbox at all. Microsoft is trying to skin that onion. We know we also operate a store on the Xbox console. It's reasonable to ask why we are not also applying these principles to the ad Xbox store today. Game consoles are specialized devices optimized for particular use. Again, right? Game consoles are different than computers. So one of the main arguments that this group has to try to make is that phones are identical to computers, despite the fact that I think any person in a given room could identify the phone if it was put on a table with three other computers. That doesn't matter because game consoles are super special, according to Microsoft. Though well-loved by their fans, they are vastly outnumbered in the marketplace by PCs and phones. Now that's interesting, marketplace, right? If this argument were to matter at all, the suggestion now is that there is a unified marketplace of game consoles, PCs, and phones, which isn't true, and this is a specious argument, and the sentence doesn't matter. But if you were to take Microsoft's logic to its endpoint here, how in the world would you claim monopoly power for an iPhone if there's a single marketplace, right? The vastly outnumbered concept doesn't matter because Epic's entire argument, the Coalition for App Fairness's entire argument, is not that Apple has a monopoly on phones is not that Apple has a monopoly even on mobile operating systems. It's that Apple has a monopoly on distribution of software on their specific operating system, on their specific hardware, which doesn't change when you apply it to an Xbox or a PlayStation or a refrigerator that runs an operating system. But they want to say that it does matter. And the business model for game consoles is very different to the ecosystem around PCs or phones. Console makers such as Microsoft invest significantly in developing dedicated console hardware. Fair enough that you can make the argument that anybody that develops hardware that is successful in 2020 in the modern marketplace has undoubtedly invested significantly in developing that hardware, right? I don't think Microsoft will come out and say Apple doesn't invest in R&D to make their iPhones. But Microsoft says, and we've seen this from Tim Sweeney, they sell them below cost or at very low margins to create a market that game developers and publishers can benefit from, which is just a wild argument, right? One of the things that we talk about in antitrust that you will see in that report, if you go and you read all 450 pages, particularly with respect to Google and Facebook, 
is that there's a notion of predatory pricing that you can use your R&D, your vast largeness as a multinational corporation, and you can undersell a piece of your market in order to make big gains later on. And Tim Sweeney's discussion point here, Microsoft's discussion point is effectively that we subsidize consoles so that we can rip people off later, that we can go get those margins from the stores, and that Apple is already getting those margins from the cell phone sales themselves and shouldn't be entitled to the store money, even though Apple's operating in an open marketplace. That's why they only have 20 some odd percent of the mobile sales across the globe. And I think it's, I think they said 40 or maybe 50% in the United States itself. They charge that premium for brand or security or walled gardenness in general. That business model doesn't change the operation of the antitrust laws. So if Epic is right that Apple has a monopoly power that it is unlawfully using because it controls app distribution on its hardware, that doesn't change depending on what you sold the hardware for. As a matter of fact, we've talked about that in this space, but Epic's theory actually suggests that Apple was a monopolist on the day that they sold their first phone that had an app store in it. And whatever that millions of phones was at that point in time, it was a pittance of a percentage. And there, nobody could argue that they were a monopoly provider of mobile operating system access, of cell phone access, of any of these things. They were always from day one when they first had an app store, a monopoly provider of iOS app access. And so that doesn't change with your Microsoft and with your Xbox, right? Microsoft is a monopoly provider of Xbox access. And if Epic's theory of the case holds, that's going to be a problem for Microsoft. Now, as we said earlier in this video, maybe they don't care because they're moving into a different business model. And if this whole thing gets broken up and walled gardens are killed, Microsoft thinks that they can benefit. That is a strategic decision that they can make. But this, this paragraph, this is specious and it follows from logic that doesn't work with the current judicial precedents of antitrust law. It might work if Congress changes the antitrust laws as they suggest in their big report, but doesn't match the current philosophies of how antitrust law works. And the marketplace for an Xbox is its singular marketplace if you're going to apply the theory that Epic is applying against Apple. Finally, they finish this paragraph by saying, given these fundamental differences in the significance of the platform and the business model, we have more work to do to establish the right set of principles for game consoles. Hey, maybe we'll put out a different bill of rights for game consoles. Chances are it's not going to say we will allow any app store to operate on them because we think they're different because our margins are lower. And why are the margins lower? Because we want to be able to charge a bunch in the store. And the fact that Apple can charge more for their phones, it just rubs us the wrong way. And so even though they're charging 30% for their apps and we're charging 30% for the exact same apps, we think theirs is illegal and bad and should be looked against and shunned. And maybe have some antitrust regulators come up and do some work for us. At the end of the day, this is all business, right? And Microsoft, as you've heard me say, can have their own strategic decisions. But what I would ask for anybody visiting in virtual legality, when you look at these kinds of things, these are not big story items. Working with GameStop, not a really big deal. Adopting these principles as applied only to Windows, where you could argue that they basically already applied and that Microsoft has a minimal market share in any event, and is, of course, trying to get publicity and do whatever it can to get more market share in Windows and maybe make Tim Sweeney and Epic happy, that's fine. That's their business strategic decision. Also, not a big deal. But at the end of the day, these are businesses trying to do what they can do to get your hard-earned dollars, to get your eyeballs, to get your goodwill. More power to them. That's what a competitive marketplace brings to the world. But it also doesn't mean the death of Sony. It doesn't mean much of anything in Epic's case. And Microsoft isn't really willing to commit to the Coalition for App Fairness's declaration that no developer should be required to use an app store exclusively. They don't want to apply it to consoles. Tim Sweeney and Epic doesn't want to apply it to consoles, but they're swinging a big cannon around and they don't really care what it hits. This has been Virtual Legality for today. Thank you for joining me. I'm glad this was a little bit of a shorter episode. This is short here in Virtual Legality, already over a half hour long, but I wanted to cover these two topics uh, because I think they're important. I think it's important to try to decode what's happening in these news items, what you might otherwise see reported. We are talking about these kinds of things, business and law of pop culture, music, movies, video games, and more in this space all the time. So tell people we're here, share it with folks. I would love to get more subscribers in here before the second anniversary of the channel. Next month, 
uh, which maybe we'll be able to do something fun for, maybe have a new t-shirt design. Uh, if you like any of the t-shirts, please check them out below this video. We love uh, those as well. I think uh, those have been selling a lot better than I thought they would, so please do uh, check them out. Otherwise, if you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching, and if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. Have a great weekend, and I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.